grown-up story time. Put the kids to bed. These are not kids' stories. These are grown-up stories. Grown-up stories. Welcome, everybody. Make some noise for Aeronaut Brewing. Yeah. Now make some noise like you mean it. I feel like I'm the perfect host for grown-up storytelling because I'm an adult man-child. I'm going through adult puberty right now. As you can see, I've got a little bit of facial hair, I've got a little bit of hair product, and I'm showing a little chest hair tonight. I don't have enough hair product for my chest hair. I don't want to waste it. I don't even know if it would look good. Prove it. I don't know what you wanted me to prove, sir, but we can meet in the bathroom after I'm off the microphone. I'm very happy to make connections here tonight. I, uh, all right, if you're gonna heckle, heckle me, not the storytellers, because I'm going off script. I don't have a script right now. I've got the names of the writers and the storytellers in my left hand, nothing in my right hand. Uh, something funny about comedians is that people expect them to be funny all the time, and we're not. We're full humans, most of us. Uh, I grew up in a uh, horrible backwards country called Western Massachusetts, you might have heard of it. Um, and as such, for Valentine's Day, I was forced to go on a date with my mom, which is awesome. Uh, on this date, my mom looked at me and goes, ugh, with that facial hair, you look just like your father. And I said, with this facial hair, I look happily remarried? Oh man, it might be time to grow some facial hair, mom. Yep, that's how things go out in Western Mass. I would do an impression of my father, but I'd walk away from the microphone and you'd never see me again. So here we are. Shower of stories tonight. It's not always happy. It can be sad. You might remember my nose from the obstacle course on Family Double Dare. It's a very big schnoz. Um, I can see it when my eyes are open. Do you have that problem? Can you see my nose right now with your eyes open? It's in the way of my vision constantly. I can't see these beautiful people unless I duck my head. There they are. Great. Uh, let's see. I have a couple of anecdotes I'll probably riff about between storytellers, but tonight's not about me even a little bit. It's about these wonderful stories, their writers, and the people who will be reading and performing the stories for you tonight. Are you ready to hear your first story? That sounds like we're almost ready. Are you ready to hear your first story? All right. That's ready. Uh, our first story tonight is called Party in the Woods. It's written by Austin Lorenko, and it's going to be read by Jeremy Austin. Make some noise, Vi. Let's bring up Jeremy Austin to read Party in the Woods. Hello, everyone. How are you? Hello. Good? All right, a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure. Oh, I'm already broken the microphone, that's great. All right. A lot of pressure going first. Be gentle. All right, this is called Party in the Woods by Austin Lorenko. The car must have chunked over a particularly bad pothole because I jolted awake, and for a few seconds, I had that weird sensation one gets when they have no idea where they are. Hey, sleepyhead, came a voice, playful and sweet. I looked over to the driver and it snapped back. Hey, yourself, I said in a groggy voice. I rubbed my eyes. Sorry I passed out on you. Chelsea flashed me a quick smile. It's all right, you looked like you needed it. I did, too. I'd just worked a double shift at my job at the restaurant. Coupled with the insomnia I'd been having since the breakup, I was bushed when she picked me up. Chelsea was an old friend I hadn't seen in years. When she called out of the blue and asked if I wanted to go to some late night party and explained that my not getting out of work until two in the morning wouldn't be a problem, I couldn't think of a reason to say no. Chelsea and I had talked before our feeling, Chelsea and I had talked before about our feelings for each other, but we never seemed to sync up romantically. One of us would always be in a happy relationship when the other was single and we enjoyed each other's company too much to interfere. When she moved away, I, ha I hate to admit, it was kind of a relief. Now she was back and we were both single for once. It had been long enough after the split where well-meaning friends started telling me how I needed to move on. Accepting the invite seemed like something that would get them to stop seeing me as a pathetic lump. So, I said, trying to be nonchalant, What's up with this party? 
I mean, who throws a party in the middle of the woods? What, you've never been to a bonfire? She let go of the wheel to gesture with both hands. A habit that had taken some getting used to when we'd first started hanging out. These guys are great. Everybody stays up around a giant fire, just getting wasted and talking about life and the world and stuff. She shot me her infamous wild grin, her hands still off the wheel. Chell, she continued to grin at me. That still bugs you, huh? I looked out of the windshield, trying to ignore her. The trees loomed in the high beams, each looking more ominous than the next. Chells, come on. She waved her hands in the air, making a corny, spooky sound. Woo! As usual, between her grin and her green eyes, I gave in and smiled back. Satisfied, she put her hand back on the wheel. You're such a bitch, I teased. I know, she said in a sing-song, but so are you, so we're even. Hey. Oh, shush, you know it's true. Hey, we're almost there. It was true. A glow was growing through the trees. We arrived, and Chelsea wasn't kidding about the fire. It was terrifyingly enormous. The pit had been built behind an ancient fallen tree that lay perfectly angled to block most of the heat. The middle of it had been whittled down to a large table with towering warriors carved into the ends of the log on either side. The heroes of a long dead culture now guarded the dozens of bottles of alcohol, food, and what were certainly drugs that littered their table. Whoa, I said in awe. This place looks like a death metal album in the making. I know, right? Chelsea said as she dug around in her trunk. She surfaced with a box of beers she'd brought under her arm, two of them already open, dangled in her other hand. Get over here and take one of these. I obliged, quickly drinking several large swigs. We walked into the party. Even at three in the morning, the party was still in full swing. A heavy beat strummed through the crowd and all the usual drinking, dancing, making out, laughing, crying, and throwing up was showing no sign of slowing. These people knew how to throw one hell of a party. Chelsea was beaming her infectious grin. The party can now begin, she shouted out, raising her beer in the air. A cheer came from the people near us that could hear her. They pointed excited. You brought it. Of course I did. Bring it to the altar. Come on, Chelsea grabbed my arm. We got to drop this stuff off before we join. She started to drag me towards the table. As we weaved through the crowd, I took a few more swigs. I was already regretting not eating a bigger dinner. The party swirled, and heat from the fire was lulling me back to sleep. By the time we crossed the distance to the table, I was already wobbling. Chelsea placed the box at the base of the table among nearly a dozen others. Hey, Chelsea. Eli! Chelsea threw her arms around a bear of a man in a bathrobe. The guy looked like Hagrid doing a cosplay of the dude from The Big Lebowski. He picked her up and swung her around in a crushing hug. This the guy you were telling me about? He looked at me with twinkling eyes. Sure is. He slapped me on the back hard enough to make me stumble. Or maybe that was just the fugue I was in. He roared with laughter. Well, son, you are one lucky guy, he laughed again, looking back to Chelsea. I tried to say something to the effect of, thanks, I agree but my muscles didn't seem to be working. The atmosphere of the party suddenly twisted drastically as Eli swept the table clean with a single massive arm. From behind, several people picked me up violently and heaved me onto the table. They held me down, two to a limb. It was unnecessary, I could barely move at all. My feeble attempts, nothing more than a slight jerking of my hips. I rolled my head away from the fire to see a cheering mob staring at my helpless form, faces dancing and distorted in the light. They weren't threatening, but delighted, which made it more disturbing. Eli was shouting something into the fire, but I couldn't hear him over my panic. 
Chelsea appeared close with a touch of sympathy in her eyes. In her hand flashed a dagger. She mouthed the words, you know how it goes, before giving the dagger to Eli. As sacrifice, we offer this man pure of heart. My mouth remembered how to speak. Hey, whoa there, buddy, I'm not a virgin. Eli looked down and laughed. Who said anything about a virgin, he boomed. You're pure. He looked at Chelsea. I looked over and she was nodding as well. That's right, he's the nicest guy I know. Always the dumped, never the dumper, she peeked. Hey, 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 that's not true either. I broke up with my last girlfriend. The crowd went silent. You didn't tell me that, said Chelsea. Yeah, well, she cheated on me. There was a snort as someone in the crowd tried to stifle a laugh and the place lost it. Eli roared above me. As he plunged the dagger, I realized that had been her way of breaking up with me. There was a thump. The fire pit exploded and a deafening call ripped through the night. I have awoken. Darkness slipped in and my last thought was, awoken? Don't you mean awake? I awakened in a cold sweat. I looked around my half empty apartment and chuckled, smacking my forehead. Awakened, I laughed. No wonder I'm always single. Thank you very much, God bless you, good night. Keep it going for Jeremy Austin, reading Party in the Woods, written by Austin Lorenko. <laughs> I, this is being filmed for Ska TV in Somerville, by the way, and for some reason I continue to tempt fate and take the hazardous route to the stage. I climb over all of this stuff knowing that I might trip and fall and eat dirt on live. Is it live or is it later? I'll get to watch it later if I knock my own teeth out and crash through the Freeway Revival Band's drums. All right, this is awesome. I love story. Stories are great. We all have a story. We're put here to tell your story. We all have a very individual, unique story. If you're not here to tell it, why are you here? Why are you here, am I right? Give it up for your own story. Give it up for yourselves. Yeah. Be the author of your own story. Don't let somebody else tell your story, even though that's what is happening tonight. That's not what I'm, I'm not condemning that per se, but I am saying write your own story. Don't run away and let other people tell your story. Give it to someone else to tell, having written it yourself. Great. Uh, our next story uh, is called Musings on Moisturizing, um, and it's written by Sophia Cavari, and it's going to be read by Maggie Hurst. So welcome Maggie to the stage. Yeah. Can I see you again? Hello, friends. I'm a little shorter than this. OK. <clears throat> nice to see you all. When my mom died, everyone got me lotion. Like, we know the woman who birthed you has turned to dust, but we really think you could use some exfoliation. <laughs> it's a constant source of laughter between my sister and I. Lotion, nail polish, candles. A few people even gave me a wine membership. Those alcoholics really have something going there, don't they? As far as I know, my brother just got hugs. I never understood the reason for gender disparity in death. Far be it from me to tell people what to do, but the last thing I needed was a scented bath. It's funny. Death is perhaps the one fundamentally universal thing about us. And yet when it happens, no one really knows how to handle it. The cacophony gets louder and louder. She's in a better place. She's watching over you. I'm so sorry for your loss. Oh, and the ever classic and equally lethargic. I'm here if you need anything. I began to easily diagnose people with needing a trip to the chiropractor after all the sympathetic nodding 
I imagined them as little Hawaiian bobbleheads cursed to a truck driver's dashboard. Regardless of your religious views, I think we can all agree that my mother will never be alive in the same way again. I guess it's just always found the contrasting imagery ironic. The only evidence I have of the day she died is a basket full of sweet smelling Burt's Bees and the memory of my own mother unable to recognize me. If only people knew how it really looked and felt. I think I'd probably have received some bleach for my eyes instead of the new line of OPI nail colors. <laughs> but do I have a reason to be bitter? After all, I did some of the similar things to her when she was in the hospital. Fuzzy socks make a great gift, but I'm not, not, I'm not all that sure that they did much to combat the effects of chemotherapy. I guess the moral here is that I'm grumpy. What stage of grief is that? Loss is something we all experience, said a therapist I went to a few weeks after the event. I wasn't much inclined to listen to her as she wore Phoebe Buffet's wardrobe and asked me to speak to the different parts of myself with my hand over my heart. Okay. Thanks, I said, handing her my $25 copay and shuffling past the Georgia O'Keeffe's on my way out. Shortly after losing my mother, I went through another sort of loss in, in that of a breakup. Not long after that, I lost my childhood friend. I wasn't much interested in hearing of the losses of others. My roommate came to me tearfully after hearing that her dog had died. I, I tried to feel for her, but truthfully, my walls came up. Call me heartless, but a dog is not a mother. I found myself thinking. Perhaps the defining quality of grief then is its isolating factor. The way it forced me to be selfish and merciless. The artist in me craves connection with others, finding commonalities in the human experience, so why did I spend so much time being such an asshole? Deep down, I knew my fruity therapist was right. It helps to know that others grieve losses as well. But my own pain, as I was unable to see beyond the images of needles, hair loss, scars, pill bottles, and eventually coffins and tombstones, blinded me. My heart felt empty. Almost as though all the losses had scraped it clean like the last bit of jam in a jar. If death is so fundamental to our experience, why is it so difficult to grasp when it creeps into your own life or, or the life of someone close to you? Don't we hear of mass, mass deaths all the time and tsunamis and government coups? I have no answers. And maybe we're not supposed to. There's no handbook to dealing with death. There's no magic phrase to tell yourself or someone else. I suppose that was the big realization. It makes no difference. It's random, it's unexpected, and you have no control over it. People die. It's pointless to read much more into it. It's odd, isn't it? We are born and live with the knowledge that one day, maybe sooner than we think, it's all gonna come to an end. And who knows what science Elon Musk will think of, it'll uh, think of and bring us into the future when we're immortal and living in moon colonies. But until that point, I have no answers. All I can say is that I've never smelled better since my mom died. <laughs> I'll never need to go to Bath and Body Works again, and for now, that's enough. Keep it going for Maggie Hurst, reading Musings on Moisturizing, written by Sophia Kavari. I didn't fall that time. I still stand. I stand. I stand for you. This is my fan club right here. Yeah, this is great. 
There weren't this many people here the last time we told stories, and I'm excited about that. Last time I was here, I don't know about the time before. Look, we got the VIP seats at the bar are filled. This is great. People are starting to like stories. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah I got one woo from the guy that didn't hook up with me in the bathroom. That's great. Um, it's great. Uh, we're going to keep the stories moving because we've got several stories to go in our shower of stories tonight here at Aeronaut Brewing. Again, make sure you're tipping your servers and your wait staff, your bartenders. They deserve uh, as much gratuity as you can offer. Also, the suggested donation tonight was $5, but if you just weighed down by extra cash in your pockets, feel free to toss because that money goes toward the, uh, the writers and the performers. Uh, we're going to uh, we're gonna bring up the next storyteller. Are you prepared? If not, how might I prepare you? Other than say, are you prepared? Yeah. All right. The next story is called Free Wi-Fi. It's written by Eric K. Ald, and it's going to be read by Tim Hoover. So welcome, Tim, to the stage. I see the signs everywhere. Coffee shops, bookstores, laundromats, libraries, Bus stations, train stations, train cars, airports, airplanes, hotels, hospitals, restaurants galore. A battle cry, heart pounding, chest beaten, fierce, a defiant, proud call to immediate action. A motto of infinite unity lifting us up toward a heaven of righteousness, justice and hope, toward a world well imagined with honor and peace. But beyond the two words? Line nothing defining the heralded cry. A blank space, a cipher, a void. No details, no follow through. No, not a word explaining the who, what, and why. So, at risk of embarrassment, right now I ask, who is Wi-Fi and why must we free him? Whom has this man, presumed innocent, wronged? Where is he jailed? What is his sentence? What is the evidence, or lack of, against him? Why are there passwords to meet in the secret societies of his loyal supporters? And why in the world is each password so different? I've tried, though in vain, to attend a free Wi-Fi discussion. But I'm only left standing alone, defeated unable to penetrate the walls of the underground, foolishly lost and surrounded by people with netbooks and tablets and all other mobile devices. How have his human rights been obstructed? What is the plan to release him from his cold, cruel incarceration? Where are the t-shirts and posters and stickers promoting his struggle for freedom? Or does the whole movement prohibit commodification? I am lost, like a child, and a coals of enigma. Now, I demand answers. I demand knowledge. I demand straightforward information. If only I had internet access at this moment, I'd Google the issue myself. Tim Hoover reading Free Wi-Fi, written by Eric K. Ald. All right. In order to get you ready for the next story, uh, I want us all to, I want us all to think about our self-image, how we feel about ourselves. I want you to make a face. Uh, make a face that is your most positive face. A face that reflects the best time you've ever had. And we're gonna do a positive face selfie all together, okay? We're gonna do that. Everybody get your positive faces on. Even you, yellow shirt guy that hit on me before. Here we go. Positive face selfies, here we go. I wanna see positive faces. There they are. All right, now you have to hit me up on social media to get that picture to see if your faces were positive enough. Are you all ready for your next story? See, I should take a selfie between every story. See how amped we are now? It's like we're on a second or third date. It's wonderful. The next story is called That Night. It's written by Amelia Clearwater, and it's going to be read by Colleen Moore. So welcome Colleen Moore to the stage. Okay, I made everyone do a mic check earlier, so I guess I gotta get this right. Okay. I knew about the club. I knew what had happened there. I, I knew it did from time to time. 
I understood I was taking my chances, but you have to occasionally, don't you? I mean, come on, walking out your front door is never entirely safe, not entirely. But you can't hide forever. And that night, that night was not a night for hiding. I thought it might be, but I was wrong. At least I thought I might be. That wasn't the medicine I needed. See, that day during lunch, eating a piece of pizza with the sauce so thick it dripped red down onto my hands, my heart broke in two and my self-esteem hit bottom. My boyfriend broke up with me via text, no less. We'd been together for two years. I'd never been with anyone in my life for that long. Few things last forever, but I had hope. So much hope that I introduced him to my family the year before. He introduced me to his mom. I don't know that I made the best impression on her, but he consoled me, telling me not to worry, that no woman he dated was ever up to snuff for her. On my end, my family liked him just fine, and I even brought him over to some family gatherings. Really, I think they were just happy that I'd found someone who'd made me so happy and would have welcomed almost anyone I'd brought home. But that was all over now. I probably should have seen the warning signs. He started acting differently. His words began to come out a little bit awkwardly sometimes, and he seemed a bit, a bit more distant over the previous weeks. I'd asked him if everything was OK, told him something seemed off. He assured me it was all good. He was just dealing with some work stress. The work stress turned out to be named Carla, who is the colleague he left me for. I'd seen her once when I went to meet him for lunch and immediately felt intimidated. She was slender and tall, even without her high heels. I, I never wore high heels because I thought they were uncomfortable and I knew they were bad for my back. My chiropractor had let me in on that secret after adjusting me the morning after I'd experimented with wearing them out to dinner. In fact, she straight up asked me if I had worn heels recently. I, I didn't lie, but it wouldn't have mattered if I had because she could tell when she adjusted my back. I, I gave my heels away after that. Carla also wore makeup and had a cover girl look to her. I wore a bit too, but I, I wasn't focused enough to keep it fresh. Reapplying lipstick that wears off after a bit, remembering the powder. I just don't seem to be able to focus on it enough. I'm not a very girly girl. It's just not my thing. After Brad broke up with me, <laughs> did I mention it was via text? I went to the bathroom and cried for a good while. Good thing I was never much good with makeup because I would have returned to work looking like a raccoon. I couldn't really concentrate on work for the rest of the day as I kept wondering if I'd put more effort into it, if I'd tried to be more femme, if I wore more skirts and dresses, if at least I tried to find heels that didn't hurt my back, if I put more effort into hair and makeup, if I was taller, if I was thinner, if I was different than I was, would Brad still be with me? I tried not to think these things. I tried hard to focus, to put thinking about it off till later, but the thoughts would not leave me and they kept running through my mind over and over and over and over again. I felt worthless. I'd had flings, I'd had connections that had lasted a few months, but Brad was the first long-term relationship I'd had, well, long-term for me, and I wasn't good enough, pretty enough, smart enough, I wasn't something enough. It, it's possible I should have reached out to friends, but I just felt raw and, and foolish. I'd made a bad decision, or maybe I just wasn't good enough. I wanted to call my sister and talk, but my family had been so happy for me finding Brad, and I didn't want to bring them this yet. Still, I wanted to cry on their shoulders and be comforted. I just wasn't ready to face up to it yet, to own these feelings in front of others. I tried to distract myself with social media and notice that there was a club night that night. I knew I would know a few people there, albeit not well. Clubs weren't really my thing, though the event did catch my eye. 
When I left the office, I decided to walk around downtown for a bit. There was a shoe store on the way to the tea, and for kicks, I went in, even though I didn't really need new shoes. Browsing the aisles, it was the heels that got my attention. They, there was a particularly pretty pair of burgundy ones that caught my eye. I knew they weren't good for my back. Knew that I'd even tripped while trying to walk them once, and thought about that all the way to the checkout line, shoes in hand. They were coming home with me. Passed a shopping mall next and went straight to the Mac counter. I knew makeup wasn't my thing, but again, reminding myself of that did not stop me from spending $85 on makeup, which came with the free makeover you get if you buy four or more items. And when the woman was finished making me over, two of the other people working there actually applauded and congratulated me. I was apparently now up to spec. I looked in the mirror. I didn't recognize myself. A little later when I got home, I was poking through my closet. I didn't wear dresses much, but I did have a couple hiding in there. I pulled out the close-fitting black dress that I wore with a blazer on rare occasion and put it on. I looked in the mirror with my made-up face, made face, heels, and dress, and wondered who was staring back. I wondered if Brad would approve. Maybe he'd even decide he wanted me back if he saw me like this. Still wasn't sure who was in the mirror. Whatever I did seemed to work, though. I went to the club, and I saw a few folks I knew and casually said hello. I was getting looks from a number of people when I sauntered over to the bar, enjoying the attention but secretly feeling a little bit out of place. A rather good-looking man walked over to me and asked if he could buy me a drink. I wasn't used to that. Then again, I, I wasn't accustomed to going to bars. I said yes. But like I said, I heard stories and tried to keep an eye on my drink. I noticed that the music got louder and more folks got on the dance floor. And then things got blurry. And that's the last thing I remember about that night. Colleen Moore reading That Night by Amelia Clearwater.